Many thousands of years ago, glacial action carved a gap a mile wide through the limestone ridge which runs north to south across Lincolnshire. This gap in the ridge is now occupied by the River Witham, met with the River Till flowing from the west to create a small lake and known today as the Brayford Pool. Archaeological excavations undertaken in 1972 to the east side of the Brayford revealed first century traces of timber houses and contemporary pottery. How extensive this settlement was we may never know. It remains lie deeply buried beneath the heart of the shopping centre. The people who were living here 2,000 years ago were Celtic and belonged to a tribe called the Coritani. Their principal and larger centres of settlement appear to have been Sleaford and Leicester. They used a coinage and their pottery seems to have links with the style of the Kentish tribes in the south of England. In the early 40s AD, the tranquility of these lakeside dwellers' lives would have been disturbed by the news that the emperor of the Roman Empire, Claudius, was planning to invade Britain. It was in 43 AD when four legions under the command of Aulius Plautius, numbering over 50,000 men, came ashore in Kent and, meeting with no opposition, secured a landing on the mainland. Once the Romans had established themselves, they moved further into the country, and whenever they encountered various tribes, they would employ their well-practiced principle of divide and rule. After some initial resistance from a few of the Celtic tribes, the Roman invasion took on a three-pronged advance across the country. Two legions were dispatched to move west, another was to advance into the Midlands, and the Ninth Hispania was directed to advance north along the east side of England. It was in 48 AD, five years after the invasion, that the Romans arrived here in Lincoln and called the place Lindum. The first syllable of this word, Lin, is derived from the Celtic word for pool or lake. Realising the strategic importance of occupying the gap as essential on the route of conquest northwards, with the river crossing to defend, perhaps to block hostile movement from east to west, and the river being useful for supply purposes, they quickly set to work and constructed two fortresses. On top of the hill, a fortress was constructed. The area around it would have been cleared of trees to supply the enormous amount of timber needed, not only for the fort, but also for the barracks to house all the soldiers. Across the bridge, which was built over the River Witham, south, around Monson Street, another fortress was constructed. Several Roman tombstones were found here, one of them being the standard bearer of the Ninth Hispania. Over the following years, the 9th Legion manned what was essentially a frontier fortress against the more hostile tribes to Roman rule, who were the brigands that lived throughout Derbyshire and Yorkshire. During this period, Linden was the most northerly of the main fortresses that marked out the boundaries of the Roman province, which stretched in a line from the River Trent southwest to the River Severn. There was no real effort by the Romans to advance any further at this period, just hold ground and try to deal with any insurgents while trying to negotiate with their rebellious and independent neighbours. In 59 AD, Suetonius, a general of merit and very popular with the Roman army, arrived in Britain with the intention of pushing the Roman advance further north. His first objective was to destroy the stronghold of the Ordovices on the island of Anglesey, which was also the centre of the Druid religion and was a refuge for all rebels and deserters. It was in the spring of 60 AD that Suetonius began the invasion of North Wales and took with him two legions, the 14th and the 20th, leaving the 2nd Augusta at Gloucester to keep the ever hostile Salers in check, which left the 9th Hispania at Lindum, the only solid force in eastern England. While Suetonius was engaged in massacring the Druids in Anglesey, news arrived that the whole of eastern Britain had risen in revolt. The rebellion was caused by the outrageous behaviour of some Roman officials who dispossessed and enslaved the relatives of a widowed queen of the Iceian tribe, Bodicea. She was assaulted for offering opposition and her two young daughters were violated. The whole tribe of the Iceni sprang to arms to avenge these outrages and were at once joined by others who also had grievances. All the chiefs of eastern Britain listened to the appeal of Bodicea and region after region rose and placed its levies at the disposal of the injured queen. 120,000 tribesmen were on the march south, burning and plundering the Roman settlements as they made their way south to Camarlondium, a colony of retired soldiers and British settlers. With no fortifications of any kind, the town was devastated by the onslaught. No mercy was shown and the whole population slain and the town was burnt to the ground. News of the rebellion had reached Lindum, where the Ninth was quartered.
Taking some 2,000 men, mainly infantry, but with some cavalry, a young legate of the 9th, of Petilius Cyrillus, hurried southward along Ermine Street to intercept Bodicea's forces. But he could have no idea about the scale of the rebellion. Against 120,000 Celtic tribesmen, what could 2,000 legionnaires do? Just south of Stamford in South Lincolnshire. Petilius's tiny force was surrounded and cut to pieces. Petilius and some cavalry managed to escape and return back to Lindum. The Romans feared that they were going to lose the whole island. The rebellion was eventually suppressed after Suetonius had rushed all the way back from North Wales with his two legions, during which time Boadicea and her massed ranks had ransacked St Albans and London. Suetonius finally confronted the great horde of Celtic warriors and won a startling victory. Boadicea poisoned herself soon after the battle when she realised all was lost. Suetonius, who was retained in command for a year longer, succeeded in restoring order within the old boundaries of the province and reinforced the devastated 9th Legion at Lindum from the continent with 2,000 legionary recruits, eight auxiliary cohorts and 1,000 horse. After Bodicea's rebellion, there followed a ten-year period of peace during which time an intensive building programme was undertaken by the Romans to repair and build new towns. This was when the great highways were constructed throughout the province. Linden was connected via Ermine Street heading south to London and the Fossway running southwest via Leicester, Cirencester and Bath to Exeter. In 70 AD, a war of aggression began that lasted for 15 years. It was began by a domestic dispute among the brigands who lived throughout Yorkshire and Derbyshire. It was in the same year that the Emperor Vespasian, who had himself as a general commanded the 2nd Augusta on the campaigns in the West Country some 30 years before, appointed as governor to Britain the same Petilius Cyrillus, who ten years earlier had tried to suppress the Boadicea rebellion. Petilius Cyrillus chose his old legion as a spearhead of attack on the brigands. Pushing forward with the 9th Hispania, he marched out of Lindum northwards, where eventually the legion built a fortress at Eberagum around 71 AD, and known today as York, which was right in the heartland of the brigands. Though Lindum was no longer a frontier fortress, it still had its uses as a base for supplying the northern advance. The fortresses here were then garrisoned with the arrival of another legion called the 2nd Adutrix, which had been sent over from the continent. Over the next 20 years, as the theatre of war moved further north, thus Linden was less under threat, and the status of the place was changed from a fortress to that of a colony. Over the next few decades, Linden Colonia witnessed a major programme of public works. The fortifications on top of the hill was provided with a stone wall at its front and embellished by a series of towers at intervals of approximately 50 metres and a new outer ditch. The wood barrack blocks inside the fortification were slowly demolished to make way for stone-built houses and apartment blocks centred around the Forum. So, by the beginning of the second century, Lindum Colonia was an expanding Roman colony. No doubt there were veterans from other legions other than the 9th, as well as native settlers here. The place would have been a hive of activity, as it became the principal town in the region. The late David Vale has left us some artistic reconstructions of the 2nd century Lindum Colonia which can give us a vivid impression of what life must have been like living here 2,000 years ago. The spiritual and physical centre of the new city was the Forum. The town hall or basilica was erected on the north side of the courtyard which was surrounded by a double ranges of rooms and a portico, walkways overlooking the central piazza and a magnificent colonnade including two entrances provided an impressive frontage on the main street of the city. The gatehouse in the distance is what we now know as Newport Arch, the remains of a second century north gate of the colony. The style of the Forum at Lindum Colonia, as it was called, seems to have been more continental in style than most of the other Roman Britain forums that were built. Among its earliest citizens would have been ex-soldiers of Mediterranean origin. The river Witham was crucial for transport for men, materials and supplies from the continent and was sailed up the river from Boston. This colony would have had numerous workshops to produce pottery, metalwork, along with carpenters, builders and sculptors. The place would have been a hive of activity. This is a rendition of the lower west gate of Lindum Colonia. 
The footings of this gate can still be seen at the back of the City Council buildings on Orchard Street. After walking and climbing the steps to get up to the upper part of the colony, you would come across this magnificent gate at the top of Steep Hill. The colony would have contained somewhere between 7,000 and 10,000 people, retired legionnaires of numerous nationalities from around the empire, and local Celtic people, and would have wanted to make the most of the Roman way of life. There were numerous temples built to reflect the many different faiths practiced by the people who lived here in what was a wealthy and prosperous cosmopolitan culture. This would be a view looking from beyond the north wall with the Forum and the Basilica in the foreground and to the left and the round root building which was where the public baths were situated. This is a view facing north from the bottom of the high street near South Park Roundabout. This road, which was known as Ermund Street, headed south to London. It was in 410 AD, some 267 years after the Roman invasion of Britain, when all the Roman armies and the whole provincial administrative class in Britain were summoned to abandon the country and return to the continent to support Rome, who were struggling to hold back wave after wave of barbarians that were streaming over the undefended frontiers and threatening Rome's very existence. The Britons were left to fend for themselves. It was the beginning of the Dark Ages. There's often an impression nowadays that Lincoln's a bit out of the way and a bit off onto the east side of Britain, not one of the most important towns uh, or cities in the country. In the Roman period, the story is completely different. Lincoln is right up there, one of the most important settlements that we have here in Britain, and the material culture that we have left from Lincoln uh, is, is second to none. Um, because Lincoln doesn't exist uh, on its own in a bubble, the whole county of Lincoln, should the agricultural supply that can bring, very, very important to the wealth and the growth of Lincoln as a city and as a, a centre for, for economy and for administration of the surrounding region. This is an altar dedication to a god known as Mars Rigonometis. Um, this is a combination of a Roman deity, Mars, the, the god of war, and a local Celtic deity, Rigonometis. We're not quite sure entirely what Rigonometis would have been worshipped for, um, but it's evidence of this Roman idea of merging classical deities with local deities. This is one of the civilian tombstones we have from the Colonia. Um, it's for a chap called Flavius Helius. Um, as the tombstone tells us, he was a, a Greek national. And again, it's some of this fantastic evidence we have in Lincoln of this multicultural uh, city building up in the Roman period. This is a small section of uh, a Roman milestone that was placed just outside Lincoln on the Foss Way, the major road running to the southwest, and uh, importantly through Leicester, which is mentioned on this milestone. Um, we often find them in small chunks, surprisingly this one has had the scription survival, which is very important, but imagine these things littering the countryside every Roman mile, which is very similar to a, a modern mile. Um, so these things have been very, very common sites for people travelling the Roman roads of Lincolnshire. These are pieces of the uh, Roman aqueduct pipe that may have served Lincoln. It's this uh, ceramic pipe with a concrete jacket along the outside that seems to have run into the northeast of the city. It's one of the, the great mysteries of Roman Lincoln at the moment, wondering whether this pipe actually worked and did carry thousands of gallons of, of water into the city, into the upper city, um, or whether it was actually a failed engineering experiment and the, the hill proved too much even for Roman engineering. This is a selection of Roman oil lamps that we have in the museum and some very, very nice bronze candlesticks. Um, obviously, we're talking the days before gas and electric light, quite obviously, so oil lamps are very, very important. Um, slightly dangerous items, obviously, with a, a wick protruding out of the hole and a, a naked flame. House fires must have been very, very common in Roman Lincoln. Um, the candle stands are particularly nice. They're items that I don't think many people would associate with the Romans. They always seem to think of them as, as being modern inventions, um, but I think they would have very nicely graced the table of a, a wealthy Roman family here in Lincoln. It's a very nice piece of uh, stone carving uh, found in Lincoln of a small boy riding a chariot. Um, something people don't often associate in Britain. When they think of the Romans as the Roman Empire, they, they think of the gladiatorial games and the chariot racing, and somehow when they think of, of Britain, that seems to all vanish. But of course, these sports must have been very, very popular in Britain. Um, in, in Colchester, in the last couple of years, there's actually been a Roman chariot racing circuit found. Um, this is evidence this sport must have just been as popular in Lincoln as it was everywhere else in the Roman Empire. The Romans are really the first culture we have in Britain to have um, throwaway tableware. Um, they have a huge, huge range of material available to, to most Roman families. 
starting with fairly basic locally made ceramic wares um, through to the more elaborate uh, imported wares such as the highly decorated Samian ware and then for the wealthiest families copper and bronze items some of which could be very very nice and at the very very top end of the spectrum uh, silver and gold tableware which rivals anything that's, that's ever been made. This is a very important item in the collection uh, it's made of lead it's part of a, a full century so very late Roman uh, tank, possibly even an early Christian font. Um, these are found in, in fair quantities. Um, this one's particularly important because of the early Christian symbols on it. The, uh, the symbol looks like a P and an X is actually a, a Christian symbol known as a Cairo, one of the earliest symbols of Christianity, almost to, to try and hide the Christianity from the more pagan Romans. Um, there's also a very important scene at the top which may depict a very, very early baptism. This is a bronze statuette depicting the goddess Minerva, um, somebody who's been become quite a popular face in Lincoln recently. The university have taken on the, her face as a logo, uh, a goddess of, of wisdom but also of, of war, which gives you some insight into the Roman way of thinking. This particular one was found in Lincoln and it's very, very high quality, highly sculpted. The, the person who's made this has certainly had a lot of contact with the continental world, was aware of the high quality sculptural work that was going on in the continent and has, has reproduced it here in Lincoln. This is a very detailed bronze statuette of the god Mercury, who was one of the uh, protectors of, of travellers in the Roman world and also a god protecting commerce. And this particular sculpture was found at uh, Brant Bruton to the south of Lincoln, but we know there was a, a temple to, to Mercury in the southern walled city of Lincoln, um, so probably a, a very important local deity, uh, especially with all the, the commerce and trade, agriculture going on around Lincoln. This may have been a figure that was, was very, very important in the, the religious lives of the local people. This rather cheeky little chappy here is, um, it looks a bit like a, a cherubic angel, is in fact not. It's the head of a, a fellow called Attis, um, who was a, a Middle Eastern deity associated with the worship of the goddess Kibble, who was a, a prophetess. It's one of the fantastic examples we have in Lincoln of multiculturalism. Um, this idea of Lincoln being a, a bit of a backwater, not particularly um, mixing racially, it's completely out of the picture in the Roman period. It's a, a vibrant city with world cultures mixing quite freely. The people of Lincoln in the Roman period would have been well aware of what was happening across the rest of the world. This little statuette represents one of the lesser known Roman deities, a figure called Dea Nutrix, who was the goddess of nursing mothers. You can see her, her here suckling two babies. Um, this would probably have been used as a, a slightly more superstitious item, probably carried around by a woman in childbirth or had just recently given birth just to make sure that she stayed safe. Um, people are superstitious today. It was certainly no different in the Roman period. People carried traditions right through from prehistory to uh, ward off evil spirits or to make sure they weren't hedging their bets with fate. This is a part of a Roman tombstone that was found here in Lincoln. Uh, it's one of the, the finest pieces of Roman carving that we have in the museum collection. It depicts uh, a young boy holding a rabbit or a hare. It's possible to interpret this in two ways. One way is just to simply say that it's, it is the tombstone of a young man who had a pet rabbit, had some affinity with hares or rabbits and is seen holding one here on his tombstone. It is more likely, though, that uh, as the hare had a, a very strong religious significance with the, the afterworld um, in Celtic mythology, even though this is a Roman statuette, it may be a throwback to this, this young man's heritage um, as a, Celtic, a native Celtic Briton. Uh, and this is, in fact, a, a strong religious message that's been given out rather than just a, a holding a favourite pet. This is a lovely little carving that was found uh, on Hungate in Lincoln, um, depicting, probably, we think, uh, Cupid and Psyche. Uh, Cupid and Psyche is one of the, the classical uh, mythological tales. Um, again, some of this evidence that Roman mythology, classical mythology, is certainly present here in Lincoln. Um, the story basically is uh, Psyche was a, a beautiful mortal woman um, who fell in love with Cupid, um, eventually betrayed him, all sorts of nasty things happened to her. Um, they do end up happily ever after, though. She is actually turned into a goddess by Cupid. Um, so probably a Roman person looking at this statue whether it was built into a building or part of a funerary monument, we're not quite sure. But that story must have been brought to life whenever people wandered past and had a look at the, the sculpture. In reality, as with most Roman sculptures, we see them in, in this, this cream, natural stone. Of course, it may well have been brightly and realistically painted during its life. So again, we have to take a step of the imagination whenever we're looking at stonework like this and realise how much brighter and more beautiful it must have been when it was originally in use. Some of the most common evidence we have of the Roman period um, is coinage. Um, it's also one of the things people most often associate with, with Roman life. Uh, this is the first mass coinage that appears in Britain, and people still, still find it and bring it into the museum for identification on a, a weekly basis. Um, particularly late Roman small bronze coinage can be found in quite large quantities um, in, in most of the fields in Lincolnshire. 
And this is cumulative evidence we can build up from looking at the, the distribution of these coins can start to point to where unknown or previously unknown settlements might be in Lincolnshire. It can be a great clue to piecing together that wider archaeology that we still don't know exists yet. This is one of the, the better known tombstones we have in Lincoln. It's a, a military period tombstone of a chap called Gaius Valerius, um, who was a, a standard bearer with the 9th Legion. Uh, this tombstone was found in 1909 down on South Common. It's one of the, the bits of evidence we have to suggest there may have been a, an earlier first Roman fortress um, to the south of the River Witham and the Brayford Pool before the, the more northerly fortress was constructed. Standard bearers aren't, aren't the most common tombstones to be found, so it's, it's very, very nice to have this, this example surviving. It um, gives us lots of personal information about Gaius Valerius himself, the fact that he was uh, the son also of somebody called Gaius. Um, the name of the leader of his century was a, a chap called Hospice, or Hospes. Um, we know that he, he lived to be uh, 45, we know that he served for 14 years, so these, these sorts of tombstones can be fantastic evidence for telling us about life in the Roman army, particularly life in and around uh, very, very early Roman Lincoln.